Hello everyone, I am Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. It may take us five years, ten years or more, but we're patient. We're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, I'm going to be talking uh, to myself today. Or rather, I'll be talking to you and I won't have anyone next to me. And this is something that I try to avoid, but today is this is probably the best uh, format to cover the state of cookie-less, which means what in marketing is being referred to as the world in which there are no more third-party cookies and unique identifiers of mobile phones, at least Apple phones, which means the IDFA or the identifier or device identifier for advertising. So I want to use or I want to approach this from a legal perspective. E-privacy, GDPR, and you know CCPA, CPRA, and the whole privacy compliance approach. To, to get started, let's say that there's a few things that will disappear as we approach the end of 2021. The most popular of which is third-party cookies on the Chrome browser. This is not something uh, that comes out of the blue. In fact, this is the last or one of the latest, I should say, browsers that will deprecate third-party cookies. In fact, others started doing this before. And as you know, Firefox, Safari, others like Brave had already disabled third-party cookies in their current versions. So it's Chrome that commanding 64% of the market when you take into account both mobile browsers or mobile phones and desktop browsers, um, then it's, you know, it will have the biggest impact, but it's the, it's the last one or nearly or almost the last one. So that's one thing that is going to happen. Google announced at the time that was last year that it was going to get rid of them in early 2022, and this is uh, what caused the panic. So that's one thing. Now, something else that is already happening is that Apple, so iOS, that's iPhone, has already disabled the IDFA or the unique device identifier as something that is available to app developers by default, meaning without a need for consent. So as of If I remember well, April 16th, the App Tracking Transparency Program, or ATT, that's when it kicked off. It it simply means that people will be asked, or they are being asked, or we are being asked, if we want to be tracked by the apps that we install. And that means that they won't be able to deduplicate or to tell who has been seeing an ad and then installing an app, for example, a game, whatever that is. So that's gone. Something else that is going to happen is that a few things are coming up to replace what we were able to do or the things that we had before. One of them is identifiers, identity-based solutions, which hope to transform first-party data relationships or those that a brand has with their customer base into something that becomes actionable or addressable, as they say, in in the media in the, or in the open market, in the media landscape, meaning that a me- this would become a means to talk to someone that has been has logged into a given platform and subsequently been deduplicated. Again, I'll keep using that word because there's no other way to say this, you know, uh, in in a more precise way, I believe. So 
Anyway, that's, that's something that comes in many flavors. The most popular these days is one called Unified ID or UID. It's an initiative started by the Trade Desk and eventually joined by others. So that is coming up and I'll be talking about its, the, the legal challenges to it. Another one is, of course, the IDs that we already have available to us as part of the World Gardens. So, of course, there's a login with Google. Google has all these properties, just like Facebook does or Amazon does, or for that matter, Apple now has. And once you are within their domain, you may be logged in. In fact, you're most likely to be logged in. Therefore, they have your identity, so they can already Again, to duplicate you across the different properties, be it YouTube or Google search or any other properties, sort of controlled, maintained, aggregated by, by Google. Same goes for Facebook, Instagram, which is the same. And, and then there's another one. So there's a, there's a fourth environment here, which is also, in this case, it's an alternative, alternative to the to the first, to the third-party cookies and and um, you know and mobile identifiers, which is the privacy sandbox. The Google privacy sandbox is actually the Chrome privacy sandbox, or even perhaps the Chromium privacy sandbox. Meaning that this is the framework that Google is is hoping will replace third-party cookies in Chromium-based browsers. Not only Chrome is based on Chromium which is, of course, the, the sort of the base code that Google released uh, at the time and now is being used by Microsoft Edge and others like Brave, in fact. Uh, but the idea is that for now it's only Google Chrome that seems to be following, um, you know, the, the, the plan. And so the Privacy Sandbox has many little initiatives packed within that name under that umbrella and I'll be... I'll be touching on a few of them, but that's, again, that's something else that we have available to us uh, that it's, it's supposed to replace third-party cookies when they're gone, again, early next year or the end of, of 2021. And finally, we have zero-party data, which is something that many of us have been discussing. What does it mean? What does it do? But in essence, it is about not knowing anything about people and letting them be the ones that decide which preferences they want to exchange, not exchange because there's no trading and there's no commoditizing of anything related to personal data, but which properties they want to simply apply to, you know, whichever is the value proposition that is being exposed or shown by a given supplier so that uh, things happen, in, happen the other way around so that people are the ones that decide what they want to get and they are, and brands are the ones that are tracked. Let's put it that way. Uh, to keep it simple for now. Okay, so let's look at it from a legal perspective, have a first approach to the whole thing. Um, something that is uh, shared as a problem by both shared identity solutions, so that's Unified ID and, and it's many uh, sort of clones and, and similar solutions and World Gardens, so these are platform-specific IDs, is that they're all subject to valid consent requirements. So something that, that will happen is that you want to use them or advertisers want to use them to activate the audiences, as we call it, to address those audiences elsewhere. So that's in media platforms or perhaps it's first-party data collected by the publishers themselves. In fact, that'd be very common. That will be, or that may become very common. You log, you're logged on into a, into a news website and then they want to you know, target you or retarget you with whatever it is that advertisers think you may be interested in elsewhere. The very fact of the duplicating you and again targeting you means that something has to be shared. And doing so already requires consent. And if, if we already have a problem gathering valid consent with cookies, which are anonymous data or pseudonymized data, we should say, imagine what the problem would be when the bar is higher because identity-based solutions or 
things like Unified ID are based on real data. They're based on encrypted email addresses, on hashed phone numbers. These are real phone numbers, real email addresses that someone has to keep in custody. Someone has to keep that data somewhere. And even though it's, you know, the system makes sure that that data never gets transferred, the risk is higher again than what we have with pseudonymized data with cookies, within third party cookies. So if you look at the rates of consent today in the cookie landscape, in the third party cookie based open ecosystem, such as the programmatic or behavioral programmatic advertising, RTB, standing for real time bidding, consent rates are very low when you ask for consent properly. And that means, according to some studies, and recently we have one from Rural University, together with the University of Michigan in 2019, and another one, a more recent one in 2020, from MIT, University College London, and Aarhus University. And if you combine those studies, what they tell us is that unless you apply some dark patterns, it's very likely that the sample you're left with is not enough to speak of any addressability. It basically renders the whole effort useless. According to Ruhr University, only 0.01% of people will consent, will agree to third-party cookies or intrusive cookies if asked, if asked properly. That means 100% risk-free, and from a marketing point of view, the way I see it, 100% customer-centric, respecting people because you tell them the truth and you let them choose. So a very low consent rate. According to the other study, again, MIT with the University College London and Aarhus University, only when you put aside the requirement, the need for consent to be granular, or the need for consent to be free as per the EDPB or European Data Protection Board guidelines, do you get an increase in acceptance rates of 20% and 22% respectively for not granular and not free? How can you get to a higher acceptance rate to go beyond, let's say, 42%? Well, you need to simply disregard the guidelines. And that is a problem. So the um, IAB, or the Interactive Advertising Bureau, has a framework that's been you know, pushed to advertisers and ad tech, and it's called the Transparency and Consent Framework 2.0. That's been the, its proposal, or the proposal to, to find a more friendly way to do programmatic advertising. That is running counter to every, every guideline the Belgian Data Protection Authority has said it cannot comply. This framework is even advocating, the IAB is even advocating for the use of legitimate interest as a legal basis in programmatic advertising. And that is, of course, another big challenge. Not only are you not asking for consent properly, but you also have a backup plan, which is that you will take it for granted because you consider that you can apply a legitimate interest. As per e-privacy, Again, as per the e-privacy directive, which will one day, hopefully, maybe this year, become a regulation. As per this directive, Article 5.3, you won't be able to use anything other than consent. Consent is required by that law unless, unless uh, you need, you, you have a technical necessity to serve those cookies, or they're strictly required when it comes to cookies or similar devices. So what the TC, well, let's say what the IAB is proposing today and many publishers are using today doesn't really comply with e-privacy. Consent is the only way. The definition of consent is what then is left to the, you know, to the GDPR framework, which is the one that defines consent, has redefined consent from the moment that Again, that we had the e-privacy uh, directive and its latest changes in 2009, which is when we changed from 
an opt-out to an opt-in. We had an opt-out before in, in 2002. Anyway, yes, it's the Court of Justice of the European Union that defined in this case Planet 49 what the interplay is between e-privacy and the GDPR and it's always worth, you know, looking at it, having a read and uh, to, to understand how that works. In any case, of course, we are going to have e-privacy and e-privacy regulation and within that regulation, something that is worth pointing out is that analytics finally will count with its own exemption from consent and so that whatever you do in terms of measuring audiences on a website to improve that website as long as it's done in aggregate and you don't mix that up with other sources for example google analytics with google ads to target that audience or combine that data with for example crm data for example salesforce it's okay you will be you will be able to do that without consent that's already uh, there in article 81 81d of the privacy uh, draft and we have been touching on that with some of our guests in the past so let me move on and briefly touch on, on the privacy sandbox i've already mentioned what that is uh, google has been trying i have to say at least there's an open discussion is something that we haven't seen you know, coming from others, and, and Google is doing it. So there's an open discussion in the within the W3C. Everything is publicly available, and there's a few things that are shown. Let's say that the privacy sandbox has a few layers. Some of the initiatives within the privacy sandbox, again, that will replace third-party cookies in most browsers, which is Chrome. Um, some of them are there for advertisers to activate data to activate the audiences to address people for example that's what we have with flock which is probably the most popular of all initiatives all of them have these bird names as you probably know anyway uh, or bird related names so flock stands for federated learning of cohorts and it is about addressing people in cohorts in interest groups it sounds great because it's aggregate data you don't target people one by one. So it really, it really has great sort of, a, it starts, again, it sounds good. It's evolved into what eventually became Fletch as a few participants in the group added their own amendments and so on. Fletch stands for first locally executed decision over groups experiment. And both do the same thing. They let you target an interest group within Fletch the way I understand it, advertisers can create their own interest group. The magic here is that these groups are stored at browser level. That means people store the interest groups they belong to in the browser. Of course, the risk is that if anybody, any advertiser, any publisher has deployed both a legacy system or an ID-based system where they can deduplicate and can read from the flux, they can enrich a deduplicated, uniquely identified environment with interest data from the flux. So, of course, it makes sense that Google says it won't support things such as unified ID or you know shared identity environments or things like third-party cookies beyond that. Uh, that deadline. But again, we don't know whether it is about that risk or it is about the fact that they see no future in shared identity because of what we said earlier on. It is an even bigger challenge when it comes to privacy than cookies. Why kill third-party cookies and then fall in the hands of something that is worse? Anyway, of course, of course, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and we have interviewed them here as well, and others have, such as Brave, the browser, have already made it clear that they see an even bigger risk in terms of privacy. Because in the end, you're tracking people across all of their websites, all of, the, all of their history, their browsing history. Because everything, whatever you see, is feeding into your interests. And they're claiming that people won't have control. 
I'd say that's perhaps saying too much because we don't know how much control people will have. And I know there are some initiatives to give people control from within the browser. But of course, you know, Google doesn't have a good track record in terms of privacy and, and sort of, uh, again, uh, thinking ahead uh, in terms of, of privacy concerns so, or even customer centricity for that matter. So anyway, the bottom line here with the privacy sandbox is that that layer, so activate, again, boils down to this with all its risks, but has one advantage. And I guess this is a big advantage for Google. And I wonder whether they were seeking this, which is that for the first time, Google will be able to do something that Facebook was doing and they couldn't, which is look alike audiences on the basis of interests. Something that you can clearly see, you know, it's valuable to Facebook within, for example, Instagram. And now Google would have a chance to respond to that value proposition to advertisers. There's another layer, which is the measure layer, which is something advertisers need to see where their money is going and to audit what's happening. And of course, the privacy sandbox have a few initiatives. I'm not going to go through them because they have crazy names, but they're all in there. And I can share a chart where I've been summarizing it. Another layer has control, which is more than anything about fraud. As you know, the open ecosystem is just packed with all sorts of schemes, all sorts of you know, fraudsters. Again, so much intermediation paves the way for fraud. There's, you know, uh, fraudulent, fraudulent uh, clicks or so fake clicks or click farms. There's fake inventory. There's all sorts of scams. And the controller is there to help advertisers and ad tech providers uh, make sure that nothing goes down the drain, even though plenty goes down the drain already, not just because of fraud but because of the inefficiency of something so highly intermediated. But I won't get uh, I won't get into that now. Finally, there's another layer, which is perhaps the most sort of, you know, dreamy, which I would call the empower, the empowerment layer, which is how Google aims to give people more control. Google has this thing called the privacy model for the web. Apple has this thing called the app tracking transparency, which in the Safari or the open environment is called the TPP or the tracking prevention policy as it applies to Safari. And anyway, these are pretty much uh, just fancy words. And I won't take more of your time. I wanted to give you a quick run through how the sort of e-privacy and GDPR and sort of the legal framework sits on top of the new um, initiatives around ad tech and digital marketing. And perhaps it'll bring you some value or perhaps you've already disconnected, in which case, either way, I'm happy because I kept you entertained for a few minutes. So see you very soon. Thank you.